But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid into the root of the trees. And every time I read verse number 9, I wonder why no one believes that. It's as if they think that John was just talking uh, out, of the, out of the corner of his mouth and not delivering a message from God. And he was delivering a message from God. And the words that he spoke in, chat, in verse 9 are inspired words when he says, Think not to say that within yourselves we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid into the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Let me just say this about verse 10, and we'll get to this later on. But when he says now also the axe is laid into the root of the trees, that's a very popular verse to use for a sermon and you're going to preach a message, so you take that verse and you take a sermon from that verse. And there's been a lot of good messages preached. Uh, and in context, John is saying that it's time to cut the tree down. He said, when, and it goes along with verse number 9, this, this mythological tree, this idea that th just being a, of the seed of Abraham, a child of Abraham, is, is enough. He said, it's time to cut that tree down. And he said the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Didn't mean that they couldn't be saved. It meant that they couldn't be saved and never could have been saved and never were saved simply by acknowledging the fact that they were a seed of Abraham. Whether, whether it be of Abraham's seed or whether it be a Gentile, both had to believe in the same Lord Jesus Christ. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Amen. Whether Jew or Gentile. Now, verse number, verse number 11, it says in verse number 10, he said, Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Every tree meaning no exclusions. Verse number 11, I indeed baptize you with, with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand he will truly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire then cometh jesus from galilee to jordan unto john to be baptized of him but john forbade him saying i have need to be baptized of thee and comest thou to me and jesus answering said unto him suffer it to be so now but thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the Word of God, and thank you for this evening and for the privilege to be here. Lord God, thank you, Lord, for all you do for us. Thank you for hearing and answering prayers. Lord, I'm, I'm thankful, dear God, for your grace and your goodness. Lord, and you watch care over us. Bless us here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I did want to mention that this week, Brother John Mullins was able to come home from the hospital and continue to pray for his health and healing and strength and just uh, for God to continue to help him. And we're glad he was able to make it home. Uh, I want to talk to you tonight, Lord willing, from... Again, as we go through the, the book of Matthew and we look at John, and verse number four says that the same, that same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. It's interesting to me that God takes time, and, and we understand in other gospels to, to, dim, to illustrate to us what John wore. It, it's funny that, that we need to know about John's attire, that his clothing. And, and I want to look at that again for a few, for a few minutes. I want to talk about the, the uh, and look at the Bible and talk about the marks of a true prophet of God. 
And someone might say, well, there are no prophets of God in our time. Well, the Bible shouldn't have put that verse in there about despise not prophesying. Amen? And uh, when much of preaching is prophesying. And uh, it, we're, not, we're not prophesying events that are going to happen. We're not, we're not to try to predict or to say when we think Jesus. That's, that's called a prognosticator that, or a false prophet. But the Bible tells us, and we'll look tonight before we close out, we'll look in the New Testament that tells us about false prophets. And there are false prophets. The Bible says that there'll be false prophets. And so we'll look at that, but in Matthew chapter 3, verse number 4, we read, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And that same John had his raiment of camel's hair, and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. I want you to see that John identifies there with the Old Testament prophet Elijah. If you'll take your Bible and turn to 2 Kings chapter number 1, in verse number 8, 2 Kings chapter 1, verse number 8, John, John was not ashamed or afraid to identify with the prophets. And uh, the, great, the greatest prophet, maybe the greatest prophet, I should say, in the, all the history of Israel, at least the most, the most hated prophet, was Elijah. And whenever, whenever John came on the scene, he was not ashamed to identify with Elijah. In 2 Kings chapter number 1, uh, we read this about Elijah, that then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And this king, Ahaziah, look at this story, and Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. And by the way, that, that verse, we could preach on that and teach on that. That's pr pr very much where we are today when it comes to sickness. Folks are looking for some trick, Beelzebub, some devilish trick, some scheme, rather than humble themselves before God. You know, it's, it's odd to me people think that we think that there's no such thing as sickness or sickness is we don't take it serious. We do believe in sickness. We, we understand what sickness is. But we are, we're not foolish enough to think that when we get sick that we're going to run to the devil and ask the devil to cure us. You say, are you saying that all doctors are devils? I'm not saying all of them are, but I'm saying that a lot of, a lot of medical science today denies the living God. And I'll tell you what, if you deny God, you're of the devil. Amen? Amen? I mean, if you, if you think that you can trick God and you think that you can fix society and, and this, uh, this modern, this movement today that's very, very much still in action to, uh, uh, to, to, to undo the, uh, the AIDS virus and HIV and all that stuff. Uh, look, these people deny there's a God and there's gonna, they're going to they're gonna come up with a, a cure, a vaccine to eliminate that. And that's where a lot of what science is pushing today and medical science is trying to push the eradication of disease the reason there's disease and there's reason people die is because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So much of, much of the medical practice and much of what they call science today is in defiance against God. The move that we're gonna, man's going to become mortal. The Bible says it's the point that man wants to die and after this is the judgment. We need to get back to preaching and remembering the fact that it's God that gives life. The reason I'm here tonight, the reason you're here and our children here is because God's the life giver. And you know when God calls me home, I'm going to go home. Amen? The, the thing that we as Christians need to get back to reminding folks about, uh, about heaven and hell, about eternity. This life is temporal. It's going to end someday. And when it ends, we need to be ready to meet the Lord. And this, this king, Ahaziah, look at this story fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber and was in Samaria and was sick. So he, he probably had some kind of internal injury here. And uh, he, he, sends, he sends to Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is not... Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that you go to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? So don't think someone's strange when, 
when they get sick and they, 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 they pray and ask, they go to God first. Don't think that they're strange for going to God first of all. And by the way, uh, uh, when you go to God first and he's just part of the solution, we're in trouble. Amen? So he says, but the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, arise, go up to meet the messengers. Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that you go to inquire Beelzebub, above the God of Ekron? Now therefore thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art going up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are you now turned back? And they said unto him, There came a man up to meet us, and said unto us, Go, turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art going up, but shalt surely die. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you, and told you these words? And they answered him, He was an hairy man, and girt with a girdle of leathern about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. When this king heard the description of the man, he immediately knew who the man was. He immediately identified the fact that, Hey, that's Elijah. And verse number 9 says, Then the king sent to him a captain of fifty with his fifty, and he went up to him, and behold, he sat on top of the hill, and he spake unto him, Thou man of God, uh, the king hath said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Again also he sent unto him another captain of fifty with his fifty, and he answered and said to him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said to them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee in thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him in his fifty. And he sent again a captain of the third fifty with his fifty. And the third captain of his fifty went up and came and fell on his knees. This fella was a little sharper, a little swifter than the other ones. And he fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God. He didn't come up and question whether or not he was the man of God. He had already been convinced. He had seen enough burnt charcoal tired bodies to realize that this ain't no ordinary man. This is God's man. And he said, uh, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these 50 thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came fire down from heaven and burnt up the two captains of the former fifties with their fifties. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him. Be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him into the king. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it not because there is no God in Israel to inquire of his word? We're talking about a health issue. We're talking about a matter of a man that's sick. We, and listen, I don't know how many times we have to see Asa died. He was diseased in the feet. He died because he didn't. He consulted the physicians as opposed to God. You say, well, he was just going up to Beelzebub to find out. No, he was looking for a cure. He was looking for some way for this God of Ekron to fix his ailment. He didn't trust God. He didn't believe God. So the Bible says, wherefore thou shalt not come down off that bed on which thou art going up, but shalt surely die. So he died, according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. And Jehoram reigned in his stead in the second year of Jehoram, uh, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because he had no son. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah, which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So I read that story because it's, it's, it's a good story. I like it. Amen? You say, well, that's Old Testament stuff. Well, that's the mark, the identification of a man of God. God's, God's men, God's, God's prophets. 
So we don't have that today. I, I don't think any man ought to try to label himself as a man of God, uh, as, a, as a prophet of God. But listen, the fact of the matter is we do have men today and we better have men today that know God and walk with God and hear the word of God. And by the way, the word of God, this book right here. Now I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. John identified with that man right there, Elijah. He wore the same clothing, but John wasn't a true prophet of God because he identified and wore the clothing. Now, I want you to see something in Zechariah, if you would. Turn to the book of Zechariah just for a minute. Zechariah chapter number 13. Zechariah 13, verse 1. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin... And for uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Isn't it interesting that he's identifying prophets with unclean spirits? You know, in the New Testament, the Bible teaches about Satan. It says it's no wonder that his ministers are turned into angels of lights, are devils. The Bible says, and we'll look at this scripture later on, but it says to try the spirits, whether they be of the Lord. He's not talking about the spirit that says, hey, man, come and get drunk. He's talking about a spirit that pretends to be a man of God, and pretends to give the message from God, but he's no different than the Old Testament lying prophets. But here's the thing, keep reading verse number 3, and it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that begot him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live. For thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. Thanks, Jim. And his father and his mother that begot him shall thrust him through when he prophesied. Did you see that verse? Read it again. And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that begot him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live. For thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord, and his father and his mother that begot him shall thrust him through when he prophesies. Who is supposed to do that? His father and his mother. You say, that's hard. You say, boy, I'm glad we're not in the Old Testament. Well, let's just keep reading, if you would. Verse number 4 says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the prophets shall be ashamed every one of his vision, when he hath prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment. What's the next two words? To deceive. But he shall say, I am no prophet. I am an husbandman. For man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer those uh, which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Now, we know when it talks about the wounds in the hands that Jesus, that there's a reference there to, our, to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But here in this Old Testament scripture, he's talking about the fact that a true prophet of God identifies with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he understands that, as we know, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If, a, if, a, if all men speak evil, uh, speak well of us, then beware. Understand that as God's people, and I'm not just talking about the, so, the idea of God's man, as if to say that there's a, in, in, a, in a church there's a man of God that we all fall down and worship. I'm saying that all God's people ought to be people of God. It's one thing to be saved, but as a saved person, we ought to walk with God and know God, and we ought to speak. And listen, if we read this book right here and read the Word of God, then when opportunity comes, we ought to speak the Word of God. And here's, a, 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 in this verse right here, God takes responsibility, and He says, if a mother or a father hear their son prophesying a false message, it's their responsibility to take care of him. 
That's pretty harsh. But he says that they'll wear the they'll wear the garment in verse number four, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. Now, John the Baptist was not ashamed to identify with Elijah. But John the Baptist is not a true prophet of God just because he wore a leather girdle and a loincloth and ate locusts and wild honey. We have a lot of people today that want to identify and, and, and try to look like what they think a prophet looks like and a preacher looks like, but they're, no, they're, they're fakes and charlatans. They always will be. They're, they're wolves in shepherd's clothing. It's no wonder that if you walk down the street, you'll immediately be able to identify a Catholic priest. Look at him. He's got his color turned up and his wife. Why, he's the priest. He's a phony. He's a charlatan. Amen. And uh, you, the, 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 it's, it's, it's no wonder that the, the, the more obvious uh, a, a false prophet, you can identify a Jehovah's Witness coming down the street. Look at him. You can see him coming. Why? They, they want to identify who they are. And they're not ashamed to identify who they are. But they're fakes. They're phonies. They're false prophets. They're liars. What they're preaching, and, and that, that priest, he'll walk through the neighborhood, and he'll expect people when they see his long robe, and they see his outfit, and, and that nun, she'll put on her outfit, and they expect the people to reverence their outfit. Brother, listen, it's always been that among religion and Christianity and the things of this book right here, there's always been two types, the real ones and the fakes. We have to know the difference between the fakes and the real ones. Let me go ahead and let you turn with me to 2 Peter chapter number 2 just for a minute. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 1. There, there never has been a time as important for us as is now to identify the difference between the fakes and the real ones. I was listening this, this morning, early, early, not this morning, earlier this week, I spent a little portion of time listening to a, to a preacher that uh, grew up in a, in a Baptist church, and he's preaching apostolic, charismatic doctrine now. He's, he's teaching his church that it's, they're going to bring in the kingdom, the dominionist apostolic Pentecostal movement and I, I listened to that thing. The Lord led me to it. I don't, I don't like to waste time. I'd rather be reading my Bible. But, and, and some people might think it's not important, but it is important to me because the Bible says that part of what will happen in the latter days there will be a great falling away. And, and I'm not a fan. I'm not a fatalist in that great falling away. And I don't, I don't want people to fall away. I understand that we're heading toward the tribulation we're heading toward the time of great tribulation and suffering and persecution. And I don't want Christians to be deceived. I think as believers, we have a responsibility to warn people and prepare people for reality. And I believe that it's not an accident that the devil is creating a resurgence, a revival of this, this uh, post-millennial teaching, this idea. And it's, it's utterly insane, but the world is getting better. God is love. And God is love, by the way, and all we have to do is fill it and, and, and just, just em embrace it and, and, and just we can, we can work it up. We can pray it down. Revival is coming, and you're looking at a preacher. I'd love to see revival come, but the truth of the matter is destruction is coming. Now, listen, hell is coming. Tribulation is coming. Suffering is coming. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. We who are God's people need to get in God's word and strengthen our, our, our convictions and, our, and understand better and know more what's going on around us. People today just say, well, just go along with it. You know, there's some things that we're not going to be able to go along with in the days ahead. 
There's some, we're going to have to make some decisions that cost us, that cause us to lose friends and maybe even cause us to, to lose a job every once in a while. Or we're going to have to make some decisions to identify as God's people and say we can't go along with everything this world says to do. They're going to be uncomfortable decisions. First Peter chapter number 2 2 Peter chapter number 2, the Bible says in verse number 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. This, this, uh, this preacher raised in a Baptist home, raised in an independent Baptist church, his grandfather, an independent Baptist preacher. His father, an, once an independent Baptist preacher. Preaching apostolic doctrine. In his sermon to his church said, We're not changing our church to Pentecostal. We're not changing our church to apostolic. He said, That's not what we're going to do. He said, We're going to stay Baptist and we're going to reach our Baptist friends and we're going to teach them the truth. And he talked about talking to 20 young men from, the, from his alma mater, from his Bible college, and, and, and how he's influencing them and helping them to understand the truth of the Word of God. And I'll tell you what, listen, if those young men would read the Bible, they wouldn't have to worry about it. The problem, the problem is not silencing that guy. Listen, that, that, that false prophet will be here. There will always be false prophets. We can't silence all the false prophets. But if you and I as God's people get in this book right here, then anybody in this church, or anybody in a real Bible-believing church, when they hear that nonsense, whether it be in a church or whether it be on the television, on the radio, you're going to know, and our children ought to know, and moms and dads ought to know, and, and, and listen, God's people ought to know, hey, let God be true and every man a liar. When we hear false teaching, we ought to know it's false teaching. And the way we know that is not because we hear a fellow say something and say, well, that's not what my preacher says. We ought to hear him say, that's not what my book says. That's not what my Bible says. And listen, it, it, listen, we can be misled by men. We can be misled by preachers. But this book will never mislead us. And we need to know what the Bible says. Second Peter 2, he says, uh, many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. What's the Lord tell us? And he's warning us. And, and by the way, Peter is writing there at the close of the New Testament. And he's writing as a close to the churches. And he's saying to them, be ready, beware. First John chapter number 4 Probably the oldest, if you look at if you look here, the oldest of the New Testament characters, the one that lived the longest and died the oldest was most likely John the Beloved. In the book of in the in in the epistles, in the letters of John, John writes, and, and no one could condemn John of being mean spirited. John was probably one of the sweetest, gentlest men that ever preached the word of God, apart from Jesus. But John preached the truth and he said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many, not few, many false prophets are going out in the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus, is Christ, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Where have you heard that it should come? And then notice this statement. And even now, already is it in the world. You see... The reason this idea in the message tonight is just not just about dominionism, but the reason why that, because we're not, the, the kingdom that's coming to this earth first is a, is a false kingdom, the Antichrist kingdom. You see, and Christians being taught that we're going to bring in the kingdom, well, they're going to be a part of a kingdom, but it's not the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to be a part of the Antichrist kingdom. There is a king coming. 
But first there's coming judgment. We're not going to bring in the kingdom. Amen. We're going to watch and see as the Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist works and the kingdom is set up. And we're seeing that every day. But that's the result of false prophets and false teachings that have always been working. Again, I'll tell you, when Larkin said that in his book, whenever he said that God has always been trying to establish a kingdom, that's a load of garbage. When God determines to establish his kingdom on this earth, he'll do it. There ain't no trying. What, he, what Larkin should have said and, and what he purposefully avoided saying is that it's Satan that's always been trying to establish a kingdom on this earth. And the way he does it is by blinding people to the truth of the word of God. And he uses false prophets and false preachers. There are a lot of people that think they're preaching the word of God when all they're doing is reiterating what some man said, that some man said, some man said, what they read in the commentary, brother. And they'll fight you over what they read, what some man said, but they don't know what the Bible says. You say, is that some new thing? Nope. Take your Bible, turn with me, look here at an interesting chapter, Ezekiel chapter 13. Ezekiel starts to... Ezekiel especially leads us to where we are now. A lot of people don't understand and won't understand this. When God talks about the nation of Israel, most all the preaching against anyone in the Bible, in the Old Testament, was against the nation of Israel. When the prophets preached, they weren't preaching about the Egyptians necessarily or the Babylonians. They were preaching about their own people because there was always... Two groups of people in Israel. There were believers and unbelievers. Amen. And boy, we have a hard time believing that. Well, Ezekiel was a part of the believers. And the believers were castigated. They, 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 were, they were looked down upon in Jerusalem. The unbelievers in Jerusalem had a false religion and a false sense of safety because... They thought in their mind that they were God's people and God would protect them because they were in Jerusalem. They worshiped Jerusalem, but they didn't know God. Ezekiel worshiped God. And God said, I'm going to destroy Jerusalem and all those people in it. But God took Ezekiel and his bunch out, protected them. But Ezekiel chapter 13, look what it says. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. Hear ye the word of the Lord. You know what dominionism is and all the rest of that stuff is? That some guy gets up in his, in his, in his sweet looking little, uh, little uh, uh, skinny jeans and, his, you know, his, and, and he stands up there and he says to the people, now listen, it's all going to get better, folks. It's going to get better. Hey, I mean, we're going, to, we're going to get Ted Cruz in office, you know, and his daddy's a dominionist pastor, and, and we're, going to, we're going to win back Congress, and we're going to win back the Senate, and, and we're going to, man, and if, if we can't get him, we'll get President Trump in there. We're going to, we're going to get prayer back, and we're going, to, we're going to get God back in America, politics, and we're going to take our country back. I, I wish that was true, but that's wishful thinking. We're not going to do it that way. If we, do, if we affect, as God's people, if we do anything for our nation, it'll be through the teaching and the preaching of this book right here, and that won't make us more popular. That'll make us less popular. Remember, bear my hands, the marks. I was wounded in the house of my friends. You're not going to preach that book right there and, and be applauded on the political stage. If all men speak well of you, beware. Amen? The hope for this nation, when they, found, when they went to Elijah, thou, you're the one that's troubling Israel. Elijah said, not me, you are. Elijah wasn't running for no political office. He wouldn't have got five votes, but he was the only hope for the nation. Now look here what the Bible says in this book. Son of man, prophesy against them. Why? Because they prophesy out of their own hearts. And they say, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Then saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that 
follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. You know what that means? They don't, they don't know God. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe and to the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the heads for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. He's saying they, they're not preparing the people for the persecution. They're not preparing them for troubles. Well, what are they doing? They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have you not seen a vain vision? Have you not spoken a lying divination? Whereas ye say, The Lord saith, Howbeit, I have not spoken. Therefore saith the Lord God, because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. And mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people. Meaning this, that the true people of God will kick them out. A true church won't put up with a lying prophet. True believers... True believers won't stay in a church with a lying prophet. Neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel, which is made up of true believers, which are God's people. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord God, because, even because, they have seduced my people saying, peace, it's going to get better. It's going to be, get better. Don't worry, we're going to get out of here. It's going to get better. Or, no, we're, we're not getting out of here, but we're going to bring revival. We're, we're, going to, we're going to turn this thing around. Nothing to worry about. It's going to get better. You, you, don't, you, don't, have to, you don't have to prepare for tribulation. But I, I don't know that I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell you that we're in tribulation, but I'm going to tell you what, we're, if, if we're not, we're getting an awful good preview of what it's going to be like. Connie was talking about in the Philippines, you, you can't buy, you have to have your vaccine passport when you walk through, through the streets to go in and out anywhere. New York City, it's the same way. But listen. The governments of the world have risen up and said, we're going to tell you what you can do, when you can do it, and how you can do it. And there are just a few people, there are just a small percentage of people that said, no, we're not going to do it that way. And people say, well, how can you live if you don't do what they tell you to do? And I say, how can you live if you don't do what he tells you to do? I happen to know who's going to win in the end. But I happen to know, too, I might take a few knocks on the head before we get there amen but that's all right i'm not going to stand up here and tell you now listen folks just go along with it we're going to you know peace it's going to get better well that's a lie it's never been good who is wounded in the house of his friends listen they persecuted jesus they hated him they'll hate us how do you know if you're right the world hates you. The Bible says, because even because they have seduced my people, saying peace, and there was no peace. And one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar, saying to them which daubed with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and ye, O great hailstone, shall fall, and stormy winds shall rend it. Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, Where is the daubing wherewith ye have daubed it? Therefore thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in mine anger, and great hailstones 
and my fury to consume it. You know who's going to you know who's going to bring down the one world government, the one world church and Satan? God is. He's going to destroy all that thing. And listen, all those that believe those lies will be destroyed with it. And it's our duty as God's people to preach the truth. And the truth is never going to be accepted by this world. He said to them, and we said in Zechariah, if a mother or father hear their children preaching a lie, it's their responsibility to take care of them. I know a, I know a family, known, known the little boy since he was born. His, his mother was promoting him, and she professes to be a Christian and just promoting him, and I, I contacted her about it. She said, well, he shouldn't have done that. Well, don't ever do it then. And I contacted her about it. And I said, now look here. I said, I don't know where this boy's at. Pro probably, sadly, a reprobate. I said, but the last thing in the world he needs is you to promote him and applaud him. Now, I, I, it's not strangers. These are people that I've known. Well, she fired back at me. I mean, I'm telling you what, and said things I wouldn't even tell you. That's my son. Don't you meddle with my family. You know, the problem is it was her responsibility. It was her responsibility to say that to her. You say, well, you can't, you got, you can't say that to your kids. You, you, better, you better tell your children right and wrong. When they come along and say, well, Mommy, you know, the teacher down there at school said that you know, if I want to be gay, I can be gay if I want to. And you say, no, you're not going to be no filthy sodomite. Don't listen to that nonsense. They're trying to seduce you. They're trying to put that junk in your mind because that's a lie of the devil. He wants to ruin your life. He wants to ruin you. He wants to damn you to hell. We're not going to go along with that stuff. And I'm telling you, the world, the devil's trying to seduce the minds of people and bring, oh, it's just, it's just all love. I'm glad I grew up in a home where it wasn't just all love. It was my daddy taught me it wasn't love. And man, that wasn't the word he used for it ever. It's filthy. And you say, why do you bring that up? Because that's all part of it. You got preachers today trying to dress like them and look like them. Lighten the loafers. I'd rather... The only thing good about them kind of preachers is that they're not really trying to identify and look like a real preacher. What bothers me is men that try to look like real preachers and try to identify as real men of God, real preachers, but they don't preach this book right here. They're better deceivers. They're just really good at what they do. And they're deceiving people and they're just saying, you know, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. If we could just get the right man in the White House, it's going to get better. You're looking at someone right here that I wish in all my, I wish all the world that that was true. I'd love to see America, I'd love to see America become a Christian nation, you know. Well, that would be wonderful, but I'm going to tell you what, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Can we, can we see revival? Can churches be set on fire for God? And can souls be saved? Yeah, I think so. I believe, I know so. Only thing that needs to happen is God's people need to determine to get in this book right here and get on our faces and say, God, use me. God, we only have a little time. God, we don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know, but God, we're in a battle. God, embolden me and God, use me and help me to stand and be a faithful witness for Christ. The Bible said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The only thing that needs to happen is for us to determine by God's grace to go out there and give the gospel to people. We can do that. We're going to bring, we're going to bring, uh, we're going to bring in the kingdom if we all just walk around, smile, and sing kumbaya, and I feel it. 